Cyanotype Daydream is one of the best visual novels I've ever read. Why? Because of its fantastic storytelling all throughout its individual stories. Case 1. A middle-aged man, a failed writer with a dying marriage, meets the daughter of a famous author he once admired, the one that snuffed out his dream. Case 2. William Shakespeare is forced to write plays for a female noble, the leading actor in her theater troupe, in a 1500 England where females were not permitted to perform on stage. Case 3. A young boy follows in his late mother's footsteps to photograph a comet that appears once every 76 years and ends up meeting a female teacher who blackmails him to come back to school. All three of these stories have one thing in common, for they are about a guy who met the girl who dreamed the world and how they are fated to never be together. At its core, this visual novel is a sci-fi drama romance story, but the way it's structured is through a collection of individual stories from different time periods and cultures that all connect together. One takes place in modern day Japan. Another takes place in a post-apocalyptic world where radio pigeons destroyed all of humanity's communication systems. And another one is set in a 1500 England where Queen Elizabeth ruled over the land and Catholics were executed for their faith. Although in that particular case, the real issue involves seeing William Shakespeare deal with being tossed around by a very domineering woman, where it's her way or his head. <laughs> Case 2 features Olivia Barry, a noble woman with an intense love for theater. She pursues her passion to stand on the stage, doing whatever it takes to perform for the Queen of England. And after seeing Will's talent for creating exceptional plays, she convinces him, well, more like forces him, to use his skills to create the greatest theater troupe in all of England. This is fine and admirable, but Will's not as eager to agree. The man's got a pub to run, no matter how shitty the food and service is. He's got to put food on the table for himself and his ailing father. Writing plays isn't a pastime hobby. It's merely an excuse, though. That's just feeble mediocrity, and deep down inside, Will knows it, and it won't achieve Olivia's dreams. As much as the story is about Will and Olivia's relationship, the love between a lowly pub bartender and a female noble, it's also about putting everything they've got for the sake of their ambitions and the steps they take to overcome adversity. Cyanotype Daydream takes you on a roller coaster ride full of joy and heartbreak. For every victory the characters achieve, something will always come up to set them back. Will thinks he's created a great theater play in the form of A Midsummer Night's Dream, but Olivia, in no hesitation, calls his acting absolute shit because Will lacks romantic tact in more ways than one. Case 1 features a teacher who's finally committed himself to pick back up writing again, but his wife calls out his actions as a futile effort. Case 3 has its main character hire a mechanic to fix his mother's broken car, only to realize that the mechanic he hired straight up stole the car with him inside. And if things couldn't get any more worse, the boy tries to steal the wheel back, which results in him crashing the car and burning the mechanic's house down. <laughs> Every problem the protagonist faces is something they'll have to confront, whether it's an internal feeling like one's own self-doubt or an external force like an opposing rival, and the solution is something they'll have to search deep inside themselves. But they can't find it alone. It's only when the other half of the pair helps them realize it. Will's vision of the world is stuck inside that little pub of his, and it's up to an aggressively assertive Olivia to smack him out of it. Cyanotype Daydream does a fantastic job at keeping you engaged to see how these characters overcome the issues they face, and every conflict is as interesting as the last. And how these stories narrate their struggles is emotionally inspiring. There's just one problem. Cyanotype Daydream has this painful problem of spoiling itself. Because once you know how one story ends, there's a very high chance you can see the end result coming for another. You'll really feel the pain as Cyanotype Daydream loves twisting that knife. It all makes sense in the grand scheme of things, but at their individual endings, you'll be wondering how exactly the story will tear your heart out. And yet, it's about the journey, not the destination. Case 3 tells the story of Kana as he pursues his deceased mother's last goal, to take a photo of the comet that appears once every 76 years in the perfect location. The only thing stopping him is a very concerned dad, his female teacher who's been ordered to bring him back to school, and a busted up car. Like any rebellious kid, he ignores the first two. As for the other one... 
Now, while the premises for the other cases are very compelling, surprisingly, Case 3 ended up being my favorite out of the initial ones. It's wacky and absurd how it starts out. Conan suddenly got the problem of dealing with two older women he's now stuck with. But a lot of the charm here is how impactful Kana's quest to self-discovery is through adventuring with these women. There's Asuki, the self-proclaimed scrap hunter, who has the freedom to travel all over the world as a car merchant. And then there's Sumomo, the most carefree and playful one out of the trio and yet the one that's also the most chained down. Their interactions together rub off on Kanan and vice versa, Sumimo being the most important. Kana might be a young kid, uncertain of his own potential, but he has firmly chosen what he wants to do. Meanwhile, Sumimo is living a life of regret, living as someone the world demands her to be instead of who she actually wants to be. And as you watch these two, their conversations feel heartfelt and intimate. They constantly open up to and motivate each other. There's a scene where the two of them are alone together an abandoned airplane field, and Kana takes a picture of Sumimo, laughing and smiling, being the person Kana's always known her to be. Case 3 itself is youthful passion. It's a story that really invokes the spirit of a beloved yet bittersweet summertime memory, one full of life lessons, self-discovery, and wholesome romantic affirmations. Sure, the relationship between a younger boy and an older woman might rub people the wrong way, but it's about the strength in their bonds that really matter in the end. And that's gonna be important, considering Case 1 features a relationship between a 45-year-old teacher and his female student. But before you shy away in disgust, Bear with me here, for this case is the most critical one out of all of them. Case 1 tells the story of Arashima, a 45-year-old adjunct teacher. He once dreamt of becoming a famous novelist, but after meeting the brilliant writing prodigy and his university senior, Hatsuno Shuho, his ambitions collapsed and he abandoned his dream. Years go by and he falls into a dull routine with a lifeless marriage, continuing to let his life run its course. Until one day, he runs into one of his students, a young girl named Rin, attending Shuho's funeral. And as fate would have it, this very same girl is the daughter of Hatsuno. No Shuho. They continue to meet, and Arashima admits to Rin that deep down, he had always admired her father. His writing could never match his. And in response, Rin expresses her interest in wanting to read Arashima's writing, words he hasn't heard in a very long time. As the relationship between these two deepens, Arashima's life begins to crumble further as his immoral urges for Rin wear away at his heart and his marriage. Even so, he picks up the pen and begins to write once more. Case 1 is the most drama-heavy story out of all of them, the most depressing and emotionally raw, almost uncomfortable, and I'm not talking about the immoral relationship. Cyanotype Daydream has you plunge deep into Arashima's headspace. You'll get to know how he truly feels about his everyday life. He narrates the dull monotony of his own lectures while speaking of the potential of his students. He talks about how his own home is merely a place to sleep. Arashima and his wife may live in the same house, but it's lifeless inside. He musters up the energy to make a change, but immediately shies away at the simplest rejection. The presentation reflects his oppressive mood, from the somber low-toned piano playing in the background, to the slow pans of the empty rooms containing nothing but himself and his empty thoughts. Arashima's given up on himself. But when he meets Rin for the first time, it's like a breath of life has been shot right through him. For the first time, he can finally talk about his repressed emotions, the feelings he's been holding inside all this time, through the only person that can provide a glimpse into the man he idolized. And the music takes on this intense energy, encapsulating Arashima's newfound eagerness in its cheerful, upbeat melody. His heart beats as he stares into Rin's rose-colored eyes, with her returning a soft smile back. After all these years, Rin's the only person who's expressed genuine interest in his writing when he abandoned those aspirations long ago. She's the one who convinced him to pick back up the pen, and as Arashima continues to passionately write, he goes to tell his wife, the one who once believed in him at the very beginning, only for her to tell him that his efforts are futile. What's the worth of a man who quit writing years ago to begin writing now? It strikes deep as you read through Arashima's turbulent emotions. There's a distinct change in writing style between this case and the others. It wants you to empathize with what Arashima's going through, his chaotic feelings of hope, love, and despair. The presentation and direction is excellent as well. Many times, a scene will reflect the character's inner monologue through its letterboxing style, and the high quality remains all throughout the different cases. 
but they can't compare to the intensity of case one, for there's nothing more haunting than reading the thought process of a guy throwing himself further down into a deeper and darker place. But no matter how agonizing those feelings are, having lived through that experience becomes an important part of yourself. All across the cases, the vision novel shows you that those memories, whether they be depressing, passionate, or well-beloved, those experiences make up who you are as a person. It's necessary to have them, as it all comes together as a key factor in Cyanotype Daydream's central case. Case Zero, Yonagi. Everything from its presentation, to its writing style, to its wonderful visuals, to its outstanding soundtrack, Cyanotype Daydream takes you on a wide range of emotions through these stories. Being powerful, inspiring, and romantic. And by the end, also wants to hit you with the hardest, bittersweet moral questions. The unique case structure can initially throw you for a loop, but all of it is meant to get you further invested into the greater mystery of Case Zero. The love story about two individuals, Yonagi, the girl without a personality, and Kaito, the man who has lost his memories, both living in a world teetering on the brink of destruction. Hi, my name is August, and Cyanotype Daydream is a visual novel I strongly urge you to read if you're looking for a fantastic visual novel experience. If you've stayed till the very end, I want to thank you for listening to me. If you're curious in another visual novel recommendation, check out the recommended videos above. And if you like what I do here and want to further support me, consider subscribing to my Patreon. That's all for today, and I hope to see you on the next video.